What is the meaning of life? Harmony is the meaning of life. I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. And this is the first in a series of episodes about the meaning of life as understood in wondrous wisdom, the language of wisdom that I've been working on all of my life, and that um, is the language that the community of Math for Wisdom is learning about with the hope that uh, it could be helpful for an investigatory community of all manner of languages of wisdom and applications thereof. So I'm doing a series uh, to talk about uh, the structural thinking. And there is a structure that I uh, recognized back in 1989. I was spending a year as a independent student in uh, Soviet-occupied Lithuania, working on my philosophy. And I had that opportunity to spend all my time on that for a whole year, which happened to be the year before the Berlin Wall fell. Exciting times. And I actually had a friend, uh, Gilvenas Belauskas. Uh, he was a doctoral student in philosophy, and he was studying meaning. And uh, there's a famous Lithuanian semiotician, Algirdas Julius Gremas, uh, who had a theory of meaning in the semiotic square. So this was all in my mind. And I noticed uh, the following that I want to tell you. And I, looking back at it, uh, uh, 35 or so years later, now I'm 58 years old. Back then I was 24 years old. I want to uh, talk about version two, a slight update. So... I will start with this introduction by giving you the answer. Okay, that seems only fair. Um, and the answer is harmony, as I said. I just realized that a couple of days ago, but if you have to make it in one word, but you'll see three kinds of harmony here, justice, loyalty, and duty. So justice is a type of harmony uh, in the external world around us, I'll claim. And duty is a type of harmony within us, inside our internal world. And loyalty is a type of harmony that relates the inner world and the outer world. And this is coming uh, from three systems that have to do with the virtues of Plato, which are justice. Uh, uh, he would say temperance. I'm writing here, ob obeying. Courage and beauty, he would say wisdom. And uh, St. Paul talks about uh, love, hope, faith. I wrote uh, believing. And uh, I add a fourth one, loyalty. And then because of these two systems uh, and the permutations thereof, there's a, 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 another system, the Andru system, which has to do with um, duty and caring and intimacy and honesty. So you'll notice um, the colors. There's a three colors here. It's a threefold, a learning cycle of taking a stand, following through, reflecting, taking a stand, following through, reflecting. Uh, that's familiar to us from the scientific method, but any kind of learning uh, where we're, especially when we're experiencing learning uh, and growing, uh, will follow that type of cycle. But there's also another structure here that you see it's four levels of knowledge, and those levels are whether, what, how, why. And so this is a sophisticated example of a structural type of algebra or pre-algebra where um, the threesome and the foursome are combined uh, in these different ways uh, to give the meaning of life. So what is that meaning? And um, I need to talk about internalization. This is what we do and immortalization, which is what God does. So for God, you could think whatever you want to call God. It's fine with me. But it's whatever could immortalize something, right? I mean, we're rather mortal. Uh, but uh, imagine if um, something is not mortal, right? 
So that's uh, in the, maybe it's an imaginary world. I don't know, but uh, you can decide. But as far as uh, our aspect of this internalization, uh, I'm thinking of justice and loyalty and duty uh, as external perspectives, which is to say, um, they get imposed on us. You know, they're external to us. Uh, we don't, let's say, choose them. They may be forced on us. In that sense, external. But obeying, believing, caring, I think of as internal perspectives. Those are ones that um, when they're working, you know, genuinely, we freely choose, we voluntarily choose. Okay, so justice can be imposed, but obeying is saying, hey, I want to voluntarily support, you know, whatever system, and I will do it by being obedient. Okay, so... I'm internalizing this justice, you know, instead of just accepting the justice, I'm saying, you know, no, I want to take it to heart, and I'll take it to heart by being obedient. And then a remarkable thing happens there, you see, if you're obedient, maybe there isn't any justice, maybe it's actually unjust. And that's, uh, in wondrous wisdom, that's a crucial fact, uh, the sum of all wisdom is to say that, you know, life is the fact that God is good. But eternal life is understanding and separating that God does not have to be good. You know, life is not fair. So if you're obeying voluntarily, you could be doing that even if life is not fair. Okay? So that's a remarkable thing. So similarly, um, St. Paul talks about faith. I wrote here believing. But... Uh, you could be loyal. That loyalty could be rather imposed, you know, that you're kind of like uh, someone look at you like, are you loyal? Are you not loyal? Well, how does it seem to you? <laughs> you know, but you don't have to be loyal in your heart. You just have to go through the motions, right? So you could be loyal to God, let's say, just by going through the motions. Maybe that means for you attending uh, services or, or fulfilling some kind of obligations, right? Or even obeying you know certain laws but but the idea of being like loyalty if you take it to heart it becomes believing okay and similarly with duty and caring that you may have all kinds of duties at work let's say right but um money can't make you care right money is an external thing money can get you to show up to work but they don't know if you really care they will know if they take the money away Right. If you're a nurse or a teacher or a daycare worker or a farmer, let's say, or a doctor, uh, these are all or a priest, maybe like these are all kinds of work where like it makes a difference if you care. Because it's coming, certain things need to be internally motivated, but you don't get paid for that. Right. But you get paid for your duties. OK, so whatever your duties are, uh, you do your duty. You can just not care. That's your issue. But it, but you can take it to heart to say, no, I do care. Okay, I, I internalize that. And so you can see where the meaning of life is creeping in. Like these are things that we can do and we do do. Now what happens? So the idea is that if we do that, what's happening is that um, by freely, and this is our, let's see. Uh, this is, in a certain sense, our consciousness. Like, you know, justice is, uh, and this is on the level of weather, right? But like, why is there justice? Because we obey. And why is the level of consciousness? Why is the level of thinking out of the box? Why is the level of looking at yourself and saying, hey, my unconscious and my conscious, the unconscious of hundreds of billions of neurons, the conscious, uh, which is a language, let's say, of hundreds of thousands of concepts, they need to be aligned. They need to be working together. Their emotion and cognition need to be in sync. So you see consciousness is extra. And consciousness can be very tiny, but it's like uh, to get that flickering right. You know, where, where you, and then when you're flickering right, when you're balanced, you can choose to step in with your unconscious or step out with your conscious uh, to be grounded in that uh, world of uh, neurons of associations or grounded in that language of rationality of concepts you get to choose you know you're on that borderline flickering so that's your consciousness so when you consciously choose to obey 
you're living on that line. You're living on that borderline. You're investing in that. Okay, and if you invest in that, what's going to happen to your unconscious? Your unconscious is going to be a very nice garden. You know, it's going to reflect your obedience. And then sometimes you'll have feelings of beauty. But because of what you're, the way you've trained yourself simply by being an obedient person, you know, in the, in the true way, like it's genuine obedience, which means that uh, uh, you're not obedient to somebody who's saying, oh, go kill that person. Um, because simply you're obedient to, um, well, to <laughs> it's the, the integrity of your obedience, right? You, it, to your voluntary choice, right? So that's so whatever you anchor that voluntary choice to, you know, that kind of transcends you, right? So maybe if if some transcendent being told you go out and kill that, well, I suppose that would be obedient, but uh, but certainly not anything conditional or etc. And and of course you could. Uh, because it's your interpretation of obedience, you know, fulfilly, like, you know, for you to be genuinely obedient, I think you would do some wrestling there, because I just think that you would, uh, would find within yourself um, the contradictions to say, you know, there's something up, and I, I'm not simply not going to kill somebody, you know, you, you, you can't make me kill somebody, and you, I would rather die than kill somebody, and simply, uh, you, if you need to force me to obedience, that's what you can do. But I don't, of my own volition, I don't need to be do that. It's not integral to my obedience. Just make me kill that person, but I don't need to go along. So, I think that sorts itself out. You, this is a, this is what I'm trying to say. So, when you do feel beauty, you know, having invested upon that, then what? And see, beauty is like a feeling. Uh, it's positive. Um, Disgust would be negative. Actually, the way I'll define it, like beauty is the absence of disgust. And it's the absence of disgust because uh, disgust is when something you expect and inside you just realize that you don't want to expect that it's too sudden or you, you're just not able to expect it. It's, so it's disgusting, right? So beauty is saying, well, suppose you have no inside. If there's no inside, you can't be disgusted. If you can't be disgusted, you start to get this feeling of this afterglow of beauty, like it just kind of, so the beauty happens when we just lose our whole inside and just for whatever reasons, just kind of like live in this external world that is complete, that is uh, sufficient, that, you know, is maybe objective in the most profound sense. And then just this beauty kind of grows, we get mesmerized, you know, we lose ourselves. So that's what uh, beauty is all about, like losing yourself. And so when you've been obedient and you have invested your and you lose yourself in this uh, wonderful beauty, the idea is that you will be courageous. Okay? And courage is a virtue. It's the virtue that by which you're able to follow through on the stands you take. Okay? So that taking a stand, following through, reflect. Like virtue says there's no going back. You took a stand, you're going to do it. You're going to follow through. So that's how I understand Plato's virtues, okay? And so what you're doing there, um, those fleeting, beautiful moments in life where you found that transcendent beauty, see, well, what's the meaning of that? The meaning is that they're going to resonate in you through your courage. That courage is like getting put into a box of virtues that's hidden away inside of you. It's the box of immortality. It's the box of things that are indestructible. Sure, the beauty is of the occasion. It can come and go. But by resonating with that, you see, like you're like a, you're like a string on a musical instrument that's been plucked. You know, you made that string taut and clean and pure. And then God, or that's really about God. God somehow struck, plucked your string. And then you were courageous. And that courage is, that's that courage that's immortal. It's the courage that's that treasure in your treasure chest of your soul that lives forever. Okay, will never go away because it's just so awesomely cool. Okay, that's your virtue. Okay, you did that, right? So that's on the how level. Mm -hmm. And um, the beauty was on the what level. It's how it seems to you. Now, in version one of this, 
uh, I thought, well, beauty, you know, relates to wisdom, and wisdom is, uh, from a platonic point of view, you know, in a certain sense, it's the knowledge of why. But when we experience it, you see, it turns out differently. When we experience it, like, why is there justice? It's because us peasants are obedient, and we get credit for that, you see. So that'll be something we'll discuss further, but this is just introductory. So let's just go through here, loyalty and believing. So St. Paul, I'm just saying, hey, St. Paul, you're dreamy and everything was beautiful, but in your hymn of love, you should have included loyalty, okay? Because it's about loyalty. Like, you know, traditionally religion would require you to be loyal, right? Like, there is no God, but the great is God, right? And and uh, the wondrous Andrus is his prophet. Let's say something like that. So you got to be loyal, right? But really, you see, um, why are we loyal? You know, or why is there loyalty? Maybe it's a better way to say it. It's because we're believing, right? Because we're taking it to heart, right? That's what makes really loyalty really work, okay? Loyalty, then, it's, it's just a manifestation of this essence of loyalty. The essence of loyalty is that we believe voluntarily, okay? And um, when we believe voluntarily, we can have an imperfect relationship with God, you see, we can be, I think that's the whole point of St. Paul's uh, virtues, right? Like, you know, when you believe and uh, you believe in the one who obeys. So maybe you don't want to obey. You don't want to be in Plato's Republic. You don't want to be, you know, in Moses' uh, law. But then that's, you know, of course, we're not very obedient in general. I'm not. But you say, but I would believe in the one who did obey. Okay. So maybe there's somebody out there who does obey. And you say, but I'll believe in the one. I'll follow the one I believe. I, so you're kind of obeying indirectly. And it's saying like, well, then shoot, you know, even when you're not loyal, even when you're imperfect, even when you're, you know, have a, well, even if let's say, which is very normal, like you have a relationship where like, well, where's God, right? Like even if God, let's say, isn't worthy of loyalty, but if you believe, if you insist, then it's all going to work out. And then what will happen? Well, then you have... Um, you will be, your musical instrument is prepared. You've done that. And then when God plucks that that uh, string of his, which is you, then you will feel feelings of love. And again, like love is a positive. Uh, it's an opposite to hate. Now, what is hate emotionally? Hate and uh, anger and uh, relief and uh, depression. These are... Um, unhealthy emotions uh, which are happening because a person is confused, because a person is expecting what they don't wish for. You see, you shouldn't do that. Like, if you wish for something and it happens, you know, you could be surprised, you could be just content, right? If it doesn't happen, no, I'm sorry, if it happens, you'll be excited, or you could just be content. If it doesn't happen, you could be surprised, but you could be sad. You could be very, very sad. Sadness is a very healthy emotion. That's very important to understand. It's a very practical thing to know. If you try to avoid sadness by saying, well, I think I'm going to flip my expectation around. I'm going to expect that they're going to steal my bicycle. Well, then you're going to be angry if they do, and you'll be relieved if they don't. But if they steal your sweetheart, you will be hateful if they do, and you'll be depressed if they don't. And it's a very horrible thing, this depression. It's a very horrible trap. You'll say, why don't they take away my sweetheart? You see, you can't win with depression because the whole game was set up wrong. You game the game in a bad way if you're depressed. You've got to be sad. you got to want to be sad. Depressed people aren't sad. That's the problem with depressed people. And it's their fault. That's what I'm trying to say. That's my theory. But, okay, we can, uh, you know, prove me wrong, I guess. That would be helpful. Or prove me right. So now uh, you feel this love, right? So what is love? Love is the impossibility of hatred because uh, you don't live in the negative, okay, with love. Because um, you you don't expect things you don't wish for. You just, you know, you just expect things you wish for. You're just very positive about it, right? So if you don't feel hate, if you can't feel hate because you're never negative, you just get this build up, this afterglow of, oh, I feel love. 
You see, I feel love. It is growing and growing, slowly, slowly growing, growing, growing. And when you feel that love, then you will be inspired to have hope. Okay? You will be willing to take a stand, say, I, you know, we're going to get through this. I'm sticking with this. And, and but you'll be able to be very precise about like what it is. Like, I hope my sweetheart is all right. I hope. Okay. Or I hope that you will, you know, find that job. Or I hope that God will listen to me. Or I hope that we will be friends. Right. Or whatever you want to hope for. But see, the love, the ideas that will inspire hope. But you got to prime yourself by believing, you know, be the stupid believer. You're going to reorganize your unconscious. When your unconscious has that moment of love, which is fleeting, you know, and who can remember that? But it will create this internal virtue of hope, which is what says, okay, you have all these ideas, you're reflecting, but it makes sure that you will take a stand, okay? Because you have hope. Now, the last one, this is the one I came up with, because this is the way I live, because, you know, I don't want to just obey unconditionally and... Uh, Believing, you know, I'm uh, like what Jesus calls the poor in spirit, uh, the skeptical, right? Like, I don't want to be the martyr who's rich in faith and rich in, you know, like, oh, save me, you know, oh, do whatever you want with me. No, like I say, look, I'll believe a little bit. I don't even want to believe a little bit. Okay, I'll believe a little bit. And I want to see what comes of that. I'm a scientist. I'm a skeptic. You know, I want to have the scientific method, right? Like, I'll, I'll take a stand. I'll follow through everything. That's what Jesus said the kingdom of heaven's all about. You know, like what you believe is what happens. You know, or we want to see what we believe. Like we want to see it all work out. And we want, or I do, you know, I want to be like a scientist. Uh, I, I, the poor in spirit is the skeptical. Okay. So, but I am willing to care. Okay. I'm not going to be apathetic. I will care. And if I care, you know, it'll be, the, I understand I'm going to take the long road. But if I care and I care and I care, you know, I'm going to start to be appreciative of the one who's making progress on that road. And, you know, so if I care about the things that God cares about, uh, and I, then, then I'll say, oh, this person, you know, why are they making progress? Oh, well, there's something divine about them. Okay. There's, or there's something just right about them. Right. There's something perfect about them. Maybe in the simple, the good things they do. So I, I will end up as if believing and then I will end up as if obeying. It's just going to be a lot longer, a lot harder, because I want to know everything, and I want to walk through the whole thing, and I want to, but I do want to know everything from the big picture. So to get the big picture, it's going to lead me to basically believing and to obeying. But, you know, always with a little bit of tentativeness, etc., because that's the kind of person I am. I'm just wanting, but I'm going to be caring. So I'm going to be honest about that, and I'm going to be, you know, open to, receptive to anybody. Like, so if you want to be part of Math Wisdom, you know, I want to be open to that. I want to be caring. I want to, if you have issues in life, you know, I, I wouldn't want to turn my myself away. You know, I try to be available, you know, and not in a really big way, but in a tiny way, you know, here and there and there and there and there. And there. That's what our life is made up with. So duty is like an imposition, you know, okay. It may all be kinds of duties you're forced to have, you know, for religious or political or civic or, or economic points of view or familial points of view. But do you take them to heart? Do we take them to heart? Are we caring, right? So that's what this internalization is about. That's why we have duty is uh, it's the caring that's going to make it all work, okay? And even if you don't have these duties, you know, even if they're not given to you, or even if you're you're not very responsible, I don't know how it is, but the idea is that you can still be caring, even in that kind of environment, right? And then, you know the story, when you have your instrument all primed, and then God plucks it, right? I want to hear you sing, right? Then, what will you feel? You will not feel fright. You can't feel fright because fright is from the outside. And fright is when we can't make expectations from the outside because it's too fast or we it's something we just don't want to expect about or whatever, but it's frightening. you know. <laughs> so, but if we don't have an outside, we can't have fright. Then everything is on the inside, you see. And if it's on the inside, then we have um, intimacy. 
if everything is inside, it's also warm and cozy and friendly and, uh, and nice, you know, like Mr. Rogers type of neighborhood, it's all inside, right? Not a big fan of Mr. Rogers, but you get the idea, right? Something cozy. Okay. So you'll feel this intimacy. And when you do, how will you respond? And just, and it, 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 this is not like this response. It's like almost like automatic. Like it's just going to, it's just going to come erupting out of you. You're going to be honest, right? You'll be honest. And so honesty is what's saying, well, you know, I follow through. I do a lot, but but do I reflect? Okay. So honesty is is making that happen. And uh, it's it's saying, you know, in those moments of honesty, right, which have come because you've primed, you've consciously cared, and that's made you a different person. It made your unconscious different. It's wired your unconsciously different so that it's become an antenna for intimacy, which then yields your honesty. Right? You become an intimacy antenna because you are a caring person, right? Just like you can become a love antenna because you are a believing person, or you can become a beauty antenna because you are an obedient person, right? This, isn't this sound like the meaning of life? So what it's saying is like, when you internalize, when you really get into life, right? And embrace it, right? And these are the ways to embrace it then in all these ways, uh, you are living the eternal life. You are living as these virtues, these beautiful things that uh, that are be putting put into your treasure chest. And um, I suppose this is what you would be reconstructed from. So, you know, when you think of like, well, if I was, um, if I die, I mean, you want to believe you're going to die. Who wants to believe that? But suppose you did die, right? But you had all this treasure chest of virtues. Then someone could look through all those diamonds and and uh, and sparkles and uh, candies or whatever you, whatever you put in your treasure chest, you know, um, tokens. Uh, so then some, well, some eternal universe or being whatever can make you into this wonderful person, revive you. This is your DNA. This is the seed, you know, that you're planting. You can be revived and maybe you can be revived as a whole nation of people or beings or a whole planet. I don't know how you can be revived. Or maybe you want to believe in reincarnation. I mean, maybe you have evidence for that. But so, well, this is how it would work. I think I right? like, so these are the things that uh, are going to uh, be encoding our whole life. So that's the treasure chest. We're doing maybe that right now, right? So there you have it. That's the meaning of life. And it's eternal life. So eternal life, again, is uh, having this attitude, you know, that God does not have to be good. Life is not fair. But we can be caring. We can be believing. We can be obeying. Right? That can be on us. Right? We has to be on us. God doesn't do that. We do that. That's why all this is here. This is from our point of view. Right? So that's really sweet. And so that means we're talking to God. We are talking to God, and God is replying by striking us, by plucking us, right? We internalize, and then God immortalizes. Okay, that's a cool relationship, I think. So you can see there's a lot to kind of think about, like, oh, there's this foursome, there's this threesome, and there's a sixsome. Let's look at that. So what I've been describing, uh, if you look at it, uh, it's two different ways of looking at this underlying uh, structure, which is the structure of humanity, the structure of morality. If you take your global workspace in your brain, you know, if you want to be neural about it, and you say, okay, I've got, and maybe you've got a map. Don't you think your brain has a map of your brain, right? Like, or your more, more accurately, a map of your mind. Your brain has a map of your body. Right? Like when you pick up a hammer, you can feel that your arm is longer, right? Well, surely your brain is going to have a map of the mind. And so um, in that map of the mind, uh, what is it going to do? I'm going to tell you what it's going to do. It's my prediction. But it's looking at how you divide your brain into different perspectives. So you kind of saw the three for learning cycle, the four for levels of knowledge. Five would be for decision-making in space and time. Um, every effect has had its cause. Not every cause has had its effect. There's a decision point uh, for, critical point for deciding. But then you get to morality. Okay, and morality is the six-fold framework. Now, I don't know exactly where this comes from. There's not like little 
signs in my brain that tell me this like this is a long decades 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 in progress i was at the college student you know i figured this out i think you know it's kind of like building up it's kind of say i got a threesome a foursome a five some maybe there's a six some and you know frankly these are kind of like the divisions of um well these are like the days of genesis if you know the story the bible story how god created the world in six days right and the seventh day was rest it's really basically the same thing you know when you divide everything into parts it's like a day from god's point of view this is how things developed right that's just a coincidence, but you know, uh, if you take it to heart, you know that's uh, it's another way to look at it. It's maybe helpful way to look at it. So on the sixth day, this is the day that humans are maybe human, but not necessarily just humans. Dolphins, maybe extraterrestrials, whoever. This is what would make us human: is morality. And it's saying, okay, we have a learning cycle, but let's make it into questions. First of all, like relatively and absolutely, also. So, okay, you take a stand, but do you do it absolutely? Uh, you follow through, but do you do it absolutely? Uh, you reflect, but do you do it absolutely? Or are you like me, the poor in spirit, the skeptic saying, I'll, I'll believe a little bit. <laughs> you know, I don't want to believe it, like absolutely. right? So then it's like, okay, little, you know, you cretin, you, you, you insect, right? Okay, you want to believe. It. So, okay, you take a stand, but do you follow through? You know, like... See, if, if I was in touch with God, right, and I could say, well, better you think than I think. Let's think absolutely. Better you do than I do. Let's do absolutely. Better you be than I be. Let's be absolutely, right? But a lot of times we're not in touch with God, right? This is actually the prayer our Father is designed like this. It's set for a future episode. But, but see, no, when we're not in touch with God, like we got to watch over ourselves. That's what the scientific method is about. That's what the learning cycle is about, right? You take a stand, you follow through, you reflect. So I took a stand, but do I follow through? I follow through, but do I reflect? I reflect, but do I take a stand, right? Now, as happens with, so that's everything is kind of summed up by all that. You can divide everything, kind of like that sums up all of life right there. But in six things, as opposed to four things or three things, or like, Free will and fate would be two things. For existence, you only need two points of view. This is much more sophisticated, right? For logic, you would need seven points of view. And then after that, it collapses. You're back down to zero, which is God. And then one would be like everything and so forth. Well, these um, divisions of everything have um, conceptions. You see, this is very abstract. We don't actually think this way directly. When we think about these structures, um, we have to conceive them somehow. So this is like perspectives, organizing six perspectives. I think it's like this, you know, now I'm not, uh, I'm not an, I'm not God. I'm not an angel, you know, in the way of being able to tell you like, this is my best understanding, right? From decades. Uh, this is, so I came up with this, like, like I was saying, like as a college student, I think I was a sophomore fresh uh, uh, sophomore first quarter at the University of Chicago. Someone was talking about wine, women, and song. I thought there's something there. <laughs> I forget like, what it was. The something, something like this. Now I can kind of like, uh, and this video certainly is helping me make this more uh, bolted down, like, okay. So, but there will be two conceptions, okay? Uh, just like with um, the levels of knowledge, there would be two to conceptions, you know, when you try to think of whether, what, how, why, you have to kind of decide, well, am I looking at it in terms of questions from an observer's point of view, from an idealist point of view? Like, well, in which case the question why is the super interesting one and whether is something you'd kind of like want to just uh, delete. It seems like maybe you know, an idealist wouldn't want to think about whether. Or are you going to think in terms of answers? Like, uh, so a materialist would say whether is the most important answer. What is an image of that? How is like a blueprint? And why is just completely ridiculous from a materialist point of view? There is no why, you know, but we obviously have both ways of thinking, you know. And so when we glue it together, um, you can see, well, it's, but it's funny. So philosophers like Kant and Peirce and et cetera, they look kind of funny. They're trying to straddle these things, but we have to straddle them. But the point being that you don't think the underlying structure directly. You have like a perspective on a perspective. You know, you have a wholeness on this, on these perspectives, which is a perspective on these perspectives. That's a technical talk right there. But the point being is that you have to choose a conception. There's two conceptions. Now, with the decision making, um, that's a fivefold uh, division of everything. The two perspectives are space and time, or I should say maybe time and space. So 
like the observer, the idealist position would be time. The materialists would prefer to think in terms of space, let's say, right? And here again, um, the idealist would think about the person's cognition, okay? Whereas the materialist would think about God's, let's say, this whole emotional life, you know, with the virtues, etc. That's how it seems to play out. Uh, uh, because uh, I'm partly saying this because the cognition part comes first. Like, you know, first we do the internalizing, right? And so you take the external perspective and you convert it into an internal perspective, you know. And then the emotional life kicks in to say, well, then, you know, from a, it's a materialistic thing, like, you know, or deterministic thing is probably more accurate, you know. We get plucked and then we respond, right? As opposed to the idealist that says, we did the work of internalizing. We did the work of choosing the voluntary uh, position, okay? And then if you do it for the sudden sum for logic, you would have increasing slack, de decreasing slack, like questions versus answers. So maybe just kind of concluding this introduction, I've allowed myself to wander a bit, but to say, okay, and I've tried to nail this down. You know, I've looked back. It's it's, it's actually a little bit different than when I was... Uh, 24 years old, I'm 58 years old. But I, I my to, to at this day, the version 2.0, this is I think what it would look like. And so you can see uh, that uh, on the one hand, you know, you could divide everything by saying, okay, we have internal and external perspectives. We have this human uh, way of looking at things, and the human can come up at everything and say, okay, there's going to be uh, justice and obeying. There's going to be duty and caring. There's going to be loyalty and believing. And we're making choices, actually. So as you go around the circle, you know, you're taking a stand, but do you, you're reflecting, but do you take a stand? Well, you could take a stand absolutely in terms of justice, where like you believe in some kind of perfect justice. They're always believing as if justice was perfect and it exists, right? It could be materialist. They still believe in perfect justice, right? Like that's just complete fiction, right? And, and actually is completely unreal. But people, we walk around, presuming that there's a notion of perfect justice, right? Or you say, you know, why don't we just be like Andres kind of skeptical, or maybe Kirby skeptical, and just being obedient, right? Because if you're obedient, see, it's interesting, like a skeptical person gets to be obedient. <laughs> so, you know, I'll just be a good driver and follow the rules, and then I don't need all this justice stuff, let's say. Similarly, like, you know, when you take a stand, but do you follow through, right? Like, well, you could follow through absolutely with duty, Right? and have it all spelled out, and you got to do everything by the book. So, you know, I'd prefer just to care. You know, let me care in my little way, and I'll do volunteering and focus on that, right? And then you don't see anything. It's like all, it's all, it's all focused on it. Or like you're following through, but do you reflect, right? Like, well, you can reflect absolutely. Say, I'm just absolutely loyal to this whole dogma, you know, and it, everything's spelled out, and I'm, a, you know, to absolutely everything, like, like Trump supporters, you know, they're loyal in a complete, total way. Let's say, well, maybe, but some of them, not just loyal, they're believing, right? Like, but who really believes in Trump? I believe in Trump as a person. I think, you know, he's a real person and maybe he needs uh, friends, right? Or maybe he needs, you know, some attention. Maybe he needs, I don't know. I believe in Trump. I'm not going to be loyal to him though. Or I don't want to, you know, anyways, maybe to pick on a person who's kind of like in our unconscious. So, um that's this part so that's the humanly part of way that's the idealist is probably more accurate but the idealist looks in terms of the human's voluntary point of view the materialist looks at now you know how things work they wouldn't say god maybe necessarily but there could be um if they really knew god they could be materialist gods uh god, godly uh thinking materialists but i for all of you out there uh, but um no, but this is, these are materialistic things that happen. Uh, something's happening, right? So the idea is that this is what happens determinist, deterministically. Your unconscious gets these uh, triggers like uh, intimacy and love and beauty. And, uh, and then they uh, trigger hope. Uh, no, I got it wrong. Okay, make careful. Intimacy will trigger honesty. Uh, love will trigger hope. Beauty will trigger courage. And you see what's happening here. And this is very important. See, when you have the three cycle, so you're taking a stand, but you're following through. Like, You see, so this would actually be like, 
uh, in between this, uh, you know, you would have, let's say, this would be thinking and being and doing are in between. So beauty is kind of like being. And what it's saying is like, you know, being is mapped to this relation of I took a stand and I followed through. So in this three cycle, you see the third component gets mapped to the relation. Okay, so there's three nodes in this three cycle. There's three relations. And what this conception is doing is saying, you know, each relation is equal to the opposite node. Okay, they're identical, they're equivalent, or however you, category theorists would want to talk about that. So that is how you um, equate them. And they see that's a this kind of deterministic, like that. that is the same thing. So when you are courageous, you're actually, uh, you know, you're saying, I take a stand, but I followed through. It's equivalent to thinking or reflecting, let's say. It's equivalent to reflecting. And somehow, if you're honest, which means that you were doing, but now you're going to reflect on it, that's equivalent to being in some deep sense. And somehow, if you're uh, reflecting, but you're taking a stand, based on that, that's somehow equivalent to doing. I don't know if that makes sense, and I'm kind of pushing that, but who knows? But that's kind of like what I wanted to say. I wanted to say that there's some kind of like, see, that's immortalizing this uh, This uh, relation becomes something that is um, a perspective or vice, or, you know, becomes something solid. So I think I've done my best to introduce uh, that is, this is, okay, so all of these were about harmony. It's about being uh, taking the harmony. Let's say the harmony is justice and saying, what makes harmony of justice work, right? Why is there harmony in justice? It's because we're obeying, right? And what does that feel like? It feels like beauty when we're also obedient. And how is that working? It makes us courageous, you see? And the courage is what lets the conscious uh, tackle those passions in the unconscious, you see? keep them orderly, right? But it's because of the investments of the philosopher kings who are obedient to, you know, the, the idea of God or the idea of good, as Platon would say, right? And the philosopher kings are obedient to the higher principle, and that is the obedience that kind of like uh, gets uh, impressed upon everything and, and kind of uh, reorganizes our whole unconscious, right? So uh, similarly... The harm. Oh, so we have the harmony in justice. It's coming from the harmony that's inherent in obeying, right? And then this harm, the harmony in a person is matched by God, who takes that harmony and uh, oh, preserves it. So you see, we extend the harmony by internalizing. We say, you know, you have this all this external harmony, but there's another place to go with it, is inside our voluntary self. We can make harmony there. So. You're taking the harmony that's there and you're extending it, okay? And what God does is saying, hey, but harmony should kind of be self-preserving. You know, if harmony is working right, it should not want to fall apart. It shouldn't be fragile, right? There's something preserving, self-preserving about harmony. So that's where this comes in. That you get these beautiful emotions which get preserved as these uh, wonderful virtues. And those, those virtues are your character, that's what keeps you going. You know, you have this habit of courage. You have this habit of honesty. You have this habit of hope, right? Those habits will just keep your unconscious on track, keep your conscious on track too, right? It's the habits of the conscious, uh, but they're, they're, they're uh, certainly shaping the unconscious. You go to Patreon and you sign up. Math for Wisdom. It's easy. It takes five minutes. Boom, you're done. I did it. Go ahead and try. So where we go from here? This was a very long introduction, but we don't want to make it longer. So we're breaking this up into six parts. Uh, this is the first uh, episodes of, uh, and these are actually episodes within episode. These are all part of a series on wondrous wisdom. And if you really want to understand wondrous wisdom, you have already made four or five uh, videos that you'll want to watch. Uh, and so now this is for advanced uh, learners. So, but we'll do a little review about um, the threesome and the foursome, the preliminaries of wondrous wisdom. That'll be for the next video. 
Because you can see this is all about fitting together that threesome and the foursome. So you need to know them very well. And also uh, about the mind, which is the unconscious, the consciousness, and the consciousness that uh, relates them. Then we get into the meaning of life, uh, which I've talked a bit about, but like uh, more de into the details of Plato, St. Paul, and Andrus. Okay, I think I, I gave you a good dose of that here. Um, but we'll look at the actual sources. Then um, we'll look at um, uh, these concepts uh, over the years, you know, over the decades, where have I kind of noticed them coming up? You know, so in particular, this obeying, believing, caring, these are uh, three ways of following the will of God. You know, obeying being the most direct, believing being a little bit uh, uh, indirect, and caring being absolutely all over the place, as in this picture. Then we'll have um, what I learned these last few days in preparing this video. I kind of straightened these things out. You know, this is a very complicated, sophisticated, uh, algebraic type of structure, which it's not written down here. You, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying I, I don't make it up, but I have to somehow like squeeze it out of my brain. I think it's in your brain too. You can imagine it's like we're living in a glass palace and we're trying to, you know, to just see right through. Okay, like a fish seeing the water, you know, a little bit of dust will help us maybe see the pains, maybe some mistakes or some experience in life. We'll see, oh, there are these glass panes all around us, you know, a lot of muck will just completely make us <laughs> not see anything. So it's about keeping those windows panes clean, but trying to see, oh, you know, knock, 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 there's a window pane there, you know, there's a window pane there. How many in, you know, in the, as a blind man, uh, or blind woman, let's say, grappling with the, the the rooms in my house, you know, where are the doorways and the passageways and how does it all fit together as I take a stand and follow through and reflect and get back where I started, let's say, for example, right? So, uh, so obviously it's hard to get things right. That's why we want a community. That's why we want you to join our community because uh, we need to work together and share our intuitions and double check and triple check and quadruple check forever and ever and ever, you know, with our honesty and hope and courage, let's say, right? And get it all, get it all in there. Uh, so I was able to figure out improved version 2.0, which basically is just saying, you know, when you look from the point of view of knowledge, well, then like, let's say the philosopher King has wisdom, right? That's wisdom. But see, when you really want to talk about, hey, what's it like for us peasants, right? And what is it like to actually live all these things, you know, and experience these, uh, this life of virtue, etc. Well, then it turns out that, you know, it's not the wisdom that's important, most important. The wisdom is actually the feeling of beauty, It's which becomes like what? It's actually a sensory thing, right? Like, uh, so Paul's a St. Paul's a champion of uh, love, you know, and it is the highest thing from the point of view, let's say, of like that knowledge structure. It's the why from a godly point of view. But see, when you actually look at how this works with regard to harmony and loyalty and the meaning of life, uh, then you want to um, say, hey, it's about believing. So then the love just becomes, it's important. It's a feeling of love. That's a very important part of love. It's the feeling part. But why is this all happening? Why are we loyal to God? It's because we believe, you know, because belief is what structures all the dogma and the loyalty and makes it all real. It's all stemming from belief, the structure of belief, and so on. So that'll be the point of version 2.0. And then um, the final part is, okay, future research, which uh, includes not just double integral checking, but uh, includes, let's say, languages. So uh, what is the language? And I think there's three languages um, of, let's say, there's a language of how things happen, how events happen, which is narration, which I've actually figured out quite well um, uh, as a doctoral student. But there's two languages I just uh, have not worked out. Uh, one is the verbalization. How do things acquire meaning or ob like uh, concepts acquire meaning? And uh, argumentation. How do issues come to matter? I can uh, pull together a lot of ideas, uh, though. But the crucial thing is I've been working uh, now with Jerry Northrup. Uh, we uh, have a language of wisdom uh, study group. And so we meet, uh, you're welcome to meet with us, especially if you have your own language of wisdom or if you want to help us uh, do research in language of wisdom or just basically just a good soul who's interested then um, join us, uh, 
A special shout out to women. I'm not a woman. I'm a man. But you know, we just all have mostly men here. So we need women to participate. Um, that's probably not the best request, but we love diversity. So if you'd like to think of yourself as a woman, if you are a woman, however that works, uh, you get a double invitation. That's for you. And so, um, uh, oh, so, but Jerry has been working on his own language of wisdom, uh, which he, he, he's kind of invented an approximate language, um, Ododu. He has uh, worked in the spirit uh, with John Ray Heyman of a relational symmetry paradigm. And um, it's... Um, so we're we're working on that now. He works in resource management, waste management, you know, in an ecological, environmental, biological senses. A huge experience on industrial sized projects, but also smaller projects uh, with you know fish and timber and uh, and uh, worms and bio, micro bio and all kinds of things like that. Delicious, so delicious muck. Uh, well, at at some point it becomes uh, it's it's con it, it's very concrete hands-on stuff. So you see, um, his perspective uh, is from the view of consciousness scattered all over, you know, in, in her, inhabiting all over, you know, electrons and uh, frogs and uh, and uh, planets and, and people and, and, uh, and plants and everything. So, uh, which is lovely, so why not? Uh, mine is much more from God point of view. So I think that's one reason why, you know, I think his perspective will be very helpful cracking like these languages of verbalization argumentation. He has a system on autonomics. So uh, I'll be explaining how this uh, hooks in with that. Um, and then um, finally, like uh, just looking at life and meaning, you know, like uh, how do you define life? How do you define meaning? How does it get put together as the meaning of life? It's kind of a curious thing to think about. You're so wonderful. Thank you for... Uh, uh, being with me. Uh, please be with me more for these uh, videos, but especially you're welcome to sign up for the Math for Wisdom, Math for Wisdom discussion group. Go to the Math for Wisdom website, www.mathforwisdom.com and uh, sign up there. We'll get, you know, figure out how to do that. We'll also look at the description below. And furthermore, uh, please uh, subscribe, like, and special thank you for signing up uh, through Patreon. You know, this is uh, um, this this is what will help our community uh, thrive uh, among all these other things. Peace, love. Just my brief prayer with you that I I bless you. I hope that there aren't any hurtful mistakes here, but that something from here will resonate with you. And so, the beautiful love and beauty and. Uh, and uh, uh, intimacy that you feel will strike out uh, and, and sing out in, in, um, and delight us all uh, with your uh, hope and honesty and your courage. Peace.